Okay, so um, I'm going to do a reaction video. I haven't done one of these in a little while. Well, not one that was able to be uploaded. See, I did two for the Beetle two Beetlejuice videos that could not be uploaded. They were uploaded and instantly blocked. It was for the movie and then also the musical and um what was the third one? I know the second video wasn't just the musical. Anyways, sorry. Off topic. Today, we are going to do a reaction to Tim Minchin, Nine Life Lessons. Sorry, I just had some soda. So, you guys are always telling me well, if, that I need to just listen to somebody, just take some advice from somebody. Y'all are so angry at me that I won't take any of your advice. And the thing is that it's hard to take advice from somebody that you feel is condescending you or might not want your better interest or you simply don't like me personally if i don't respect you i'm not not going to learn anything from you no matter how much you know on the subject i'm stubborn that way <laughs> when i was learning to drive I, my grandfather taught me how to drive. My father told me that he wasn't going to let me take the test until he taught me. And I was not going to learn from that man. Nope. I was not willing to take a driving lesson from my truck driver of a father. I still got my license. But the point is that with me, if I don't want to hear it, I'm not going to hear it. And that's the problem with most of the advice that you guys give. It's coming from you. It may as well be driving advice from my father. It's not that it's not good advice. It's that I have no faith in you. You've all put me down so much and tried everything to stop me from just existing. So... One person that I am willing to take advice from is Tim Minchin. I've been watching his videos recently. I've known about him for a while. I'm a, I am I love Broadway musicals, and Tim Minchin wrote Matilda, which I absolutely adore. So, <clears throat> I think he also did, I think he said he was going to do Groundhog Day, if that one did. Anyways, um, so, we are going to watch this video called Life Lessons. Nine life lessons from Tim Minchin, and maybe I will learn something. Maybe y'all will learn something. Um, if anybody out there uh, is new to my channel and would like to help me out in the whole survival thing that I've been trying to do for a while here, I have a PayPal. PayPal me slash Adrasia. Here, hold on. I have a prop. <laughs> it's my purse. Oh, it's backwards. How do I mirror? Can I do that? No. Okay, well, flip that backwards. And let's go. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Tim Minchin. I need to, I need to resize. Hold on. Yes, I should have done that before, but I thought I did. That's why the thing was over to the side. But I guess that thing wasn't... Okay, hold on. Go away, lines. Thank you. I could pause it, but... I don't respect you guys enough. How's that feel? days I did a corporate gig at a conference for this big company who made and sat and sold accounting software 
In a bid, I presume, to inspire their salespeople to greater heights, they'd forked out 12 grand for an inspirational speaker who was this extreme sports guy who had had a couple of his limbs frozen off when he got stuck on a ledge on some mountain. Okay. It was weird. Software salespeople, I think, need to hear from someone who has had a long, successful and happy career in software sales, not from an overly optimistic ex-mountaineer. Some poor guy who had arrived in the morning hoping to learn more. Sorry. Overly optimistic mountaineer. I'm okay. About sales techniques, ended up going home worried about the blood flow to his extremities. <laughs> it's not inspirational, it's confusing. And if the mountain was meant to be a symbol of life's challenges and the loss of limbs a metaphor for sacrifice, the software guy's not going to get it. Is he? Because he didn't do an arts degree, did he? <laughs> he should have. Arts degrees are awesome and they help you find meaning where there is none. <laughs> and let me assure you, there is none. <laughs> Don't go looking for it. Searching for meaning is like searching for a rhyme scheme in a cookbook. You won't find it and it'll bugger up your souffle. <laughs> if you didn't like that metaphor, you won't like the rest of it. I have to pause just for a second because it reminds me that finding a rhyme scheme in a recipe messing up your souffle. There was, uh, there have been religious leaders who read the Bible specific ways, like looking for words that go together but aren't together. Like they, they re they literally cut out full passages just to interpret it their own way, and it's weird <laughs> just like he's talking about if you have a recipe you would just read the recipe you wouldn't try to find something unique and special in it but there's people that do that with the bible and then control other people's lives with it point being i'm not an inspirational speaker i've never lost a limb on a mountainside metaphorically or otherwise and i'm certainly not here to give career advice because well i've never really had what most would consider a job same. However, I have had large groups of people listening to what I say for quite a few years now, and it's given me an inflated sense of self-importance. So I will now, at the ripe old age of 37.9, bestow upon you nine life lessons. Same as me, 37. To echo, of course, the nine lessons of carols of the traditional Christmas service, which is also pretty obscure. You might find some of this stuff inspiring, you will definitely find some of it boring, and you will definitely forget all of it within a week. And be warned, there will be lots of hokey similes and obscure aphorisms which start well, but end up making no sense. So listen up or you'll get lost, like a blind man clapping in a pharmacy trying to echolocate the contact lens fluid. It's looking for my old poetry teacher. Here we go. Ready? One, you don't have to have a dream. Americans on talent shows always talk about their dreams. Fine, if you have something you've always wanted to do, dreamed of, like in your heart, go for it. After all, it's something to do with your time, chasing a dream. And if it's a big enough one, it'll take you most of your life to achieve. So by the time you get to it and are staring to the, into the abyss of the meaninglessness of your achievement, you'll be almost dead, so it won't matter. I never really had one of these dreams, and so I advocate passionate dedication to the pursuit of short-term goals. Be micro-ambitious. Put your head down and work with pride on whatever is in front of you. You never know where you might end up. Just be aware the next worthy pursuit will probably appear in your periphery, which is why you should be careful of long-term dreams. If you focus too far in front of you, you won't see the shiny thing out the corner of your eye. Right? Good. Advice. Metaphor. Look at me go. Two. Okay. Don't seek happiness. Happiness is like an orgasm. If you think about it too much, it goes away. Sorry, I need to take a second to enjoy how much the elderly man next to him is loving that euphemism. Keep busy and aim to make someone else happy and you might find you get some as a side effect. We didn't evolve to be constantly content. Contented Homo erectus got eaten before passing on their genes. Three, remember it's all 
luck. You are lucky to be here. You are incalculably, incalculably lucky to be born and incredibly lucky to be brought up by a nice family that helped you get educated and encouraged you to go to uni. Or if you were born into a horrible family, that's unlucky and you have my sympathy, but you are still lucky. Lucky that you happen to be made of the sort of DNA that went on to make the sort of brain which, when placed in a horrible childhood environment, would make decisions that meant you ended up eventually graduating uni. Well done, you, for dragging yourself up by your shoelaces, but you were lucky. You didn't create the bit of you that dragged you up. They're not even your shoelaces. I suppose I worked hard to achieve whatever dubious achievements I've achieved, but I didn't make the bit of me that works hard. And more than any more than I made the bit of me that ate too many burgers instead of attending lectures when I was here at UWA. Understanding that you can't truly take credit for your successes nor truly blame others for their failures will humble you and make you more compassionate. Amazing. Empathy is intuitive, but is also something you can work on intellectually. Four, exercise. I'm sorry, you pasty pale smoking philosophy grads arching your eyebrows into a Cartesian curve as you watch the human movement mob winding their way through them, the miniature traffic cones of their existence. You are wrong and they are right. Well, you're half right. You think, therefore you are, but also you jog, therefore you sleep, therefore you're not overwhelmed by existential angst. You can't be can't and you don't want to be. Play a sport, do yoga, pump iron, run, whatever, but take care of your body. You're going to need it. Most of you mob are going to live to nearly 100. And even the poorest of you will achieve a level of wealth that most humans throughout history could not have dreamed of. And this long, luxurious life ahead of you is going to make you depressed. <laughs> but don't despair. There is an inverse correlation between depression and exercise. Do it. Run, my beautiful intellectuals. Run. Five, be hard on your opinions. A famous bon mot asserts that opinions are like assholes and that everyone has one. There is great wisdom in this, but I would add that opinions differ significantly from assholes and that yours should be constantly and thoroughly examined. Constantly. I used to do exams in here. It's revenge. We must think critically and not just about the ideas of others. Be hard on your beliefs. Take them out onto the veranda and hit them with a cricket bat. Be intellectually rigorous. Identify your biases, your prejudices, your privileges. Most of society's arguments are kept alive by a failure to acknowledge nuance. We tend to generate false dichotomies and then try to argue one point using two entirely different sets of assumptions, like two tennis players trying to win a match by hitting beautifully executed shots from either end of separate tennis courts. By the way, while I have science and arts graduates in front of me, please don't make the mistake of thinking the arts and sciences are at odds with one another. That is a recent, stupid and damaging idea. You don't have to be unscientific to make beautiful art, to write beautiful things. If you need proof, Twain, Douglas Adams, Vonnegut, McEwan, Sagan, Shakespeare, Dickens for a start. You don't need to be superstitious to be a poet. You don't need to hate GM technology to care about the beauty of the planet. You don't have to claim a soul to promote compassion. Science is not a body of knowledge nor a belief system. It is just a term which describes humankind's incremental acquisition of understanding through observation. Science is awesome. The arts and sciences need to work together to improve how knowledge is communicated. The idea that many Australians, including our new PM and my distant cousin Nick Minchin, believe that sci the science of anthropogenic global warming is controversial is a powerful indicator of the extent of our failure to communicate. The fact that 30% of the people in this room just bristled is further evidence still. <laughs> the fact that that bristling is more to do with politics than science is even more despairing. Six, be a teacher, please, please, please be a teacher. Teachers are the most admirable and important people in the world. You don't have to do it forever, but if you're in doubt about what to do, be an amazing teacher. Just for your 20s, be a teacher. Be a primary school teacher, especially if you're a bloke. We need male primary school teachers. Let me pause for a second. I have a friend who I went to high school with who is a teacher. Uh, I believe she teaches kindergarten, and she is... Those children just bring so much joy to her life, and she gets new children every year to bring her more joy. It's just 
sometimes seeing her Facebook makes me happy because she's always talking about her kids. So I can ag I can agree with him on the be a teacher thing, but if you're capable, of course, not everybody has the knowledge and experience to be able to teach. Eventually everybody would though. Something. Even if you're not a teacher, be a teacher. Share your ideas. Don't take for granted your education. Rejoice in what you learn and spray it. Seven, define yourself by what you love. I found myself doing this thing a bit recently where if someone asks me what sort of music I like, I say, well, I don't listen to the radio because pop song lyrics annoy me. Or if someone asks me what food I like, I say, I think truffle oil is overused and slightly obnoxious. And I see it all the time online, people whose idea of being part of a subculture is to hate Coldplay or football or feminists or the Liberal Party. We have a tendency to define ourselves in opposition to stuff. As a comedian, I make my living out of it. But try to also express your passion for things you love. Be demonstrative and generous in your praise of those you admire. Send thank you cards and give standing ovations. Be pro stuff, not just anti stuff. Eight. Respect people with less power than you. I have in the past made important decisions about people I work with, agents and producers, big decisions based largely on how they treat the wait staff in the restaurants we're having the meeting in. I don't care if you're the most powerful cat in the room. I will judge you on how you treat the least powerful. So there. Nine, finally, don't rush. You don't need to already know what you're going to do with the rest of your life. I'm not saying sit around smoking cones all day, but also don't panic. Most people I know who were sure of their career path at 20 are having midlife crises now. I said at the beginning of this ramble, which is already three and a half minutes long, that life is meaningless. It was not a flippant assertion. I think it's absurd, the idea of seeking meaning in the set of circumstances that happens to exist after 13.8 billion years worth of unguided events. Leave it to humans to think the universe has a purpose for them. However, I am no nihilist. I'm not even a cynic. I am actually rather romantic. And here's my idea of romance. You will soon be dead. <laughs> Life will sometimes seem long and tough, and God, it's tiring. And you will sometimes be happy and sometimes sad, and then you'll be old, and then you'll be dead. There is only one sensible thing to do with this empty existence, and that is fill it. Not fill it, fill it. And in my opinion, until I change it, life is best filled by learning as much as you can about as much as you can, taking pride in whatever you're doing, having compassion, sharing ideas, running, being enthusiastic. And then there's love and travel and wine and sex and art and kids and giving and mountain climbing. But you know all that stuff already. It's an incredibly exciting thing, this one meaningless life of yours. Good luck, and thank you for indulging me. I like that. I think what I take most from it is you, you don't have to have a dream, which is good, because I never had one. Um... That was Nine Life Lessons by, by Tim Minchin. Uh, I hope you guys took something from it.